Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, and I do mean over the top beautiful fall day <coughs> here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Just an absolute postcard perfect fall day. <coughs> it would be Sunday. October 16th, 2022. I believe we are halfway through October. So since it is Sunday, time for my weekly doomsday sermon. And you guys might be a little surprised at my choice of uh, doomsday preacher today. And that is none other than Bill McKibben. And uh, I've had some... Uh, fun, shall we say, uh, doing some well-deserved trash talking about Bill McKibben, you know, after seeing Planet of the Humans and seeing the, you know, the evil twin of that nice old man up there in Vermont, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater with Bill McKibben, but I'm going to try I'm really going to try, since it's a beautiful Sunday afternoon, to, to somewhat contain my snarky comments until possibly when, you know, the hopium gets here at the very end. But I want to tip my hat to Bill McKibben for uh, his review of the World Wildlife Fund's Dying Planet Report 2022. I had my own review of it. This isn't so much uh, Bill McKibben's review of it as just his emotional reaction to it. So we're gonna, as they try, say, try to leave the snark behind the best I can and let Bill McKibben tell us about a fast emptying arc the world grows quieter by the day, and um, I found this uh, on Common Dreams this morning. Those little lefties over at Common Dreams, <coughs> uh, coming from, I guess, his website on Substack. Anyway, take it away. Bill McKibben, give us your thoughts on our fast emptying arc where a vast new study finds there are 70% fewer wild animals sharing the earth with us than there were in 1970. <clears throat> okay, Bill, take it away. I confess, for reasons I can't fully explain, that when bad things are happening to animals, I tend to look away in pain. When bad things are happening to people, I try to face those things squarely and do what I can, but there is something about wildlife, perhaps the way it's become implicated in our strange human game without having the slightest agency at all, that just confounds me. Some kind of sad and disabling rage fills me. Sometimes, however, the truths are just too overwhelming to avoid. A vast new study finds that there are 70 percent fewer wild animals sharing the earth with, with us than there were in 1970. Read that again. Okay. A vast new study finds there are 70% fewer wild animals sharing the earth with us than there were in 1970. Now read that again. Okay. A vast new study finds there are 70% fewer wild animals sharing the earth with us than there were in 
1970. <clears throat> okay, I think we get it. To be more specific, the World Wildlife Fund's Dying Planet Index, which monitors 32,000 separate populations of species around the world, found that on average they were 69% smaller than they had been in 1970. <clears throat> this is not because we had an overpopulation of bears and monkeys and parrotfish in 1970. I was alive then, and I am pretty confident in my memory <clears throat> that we were not overrun with wildlife. Instead, it is because we have not reined ourselves in in any way. It's because we, with a particular emphasis on those with the most money and power, which probably includes Bill McGibbon, have claimed ever more of the planet for ourselves, often without really knowing it. The World Wildlife Fund says, quote, these populations or trends in relative abundance are important because they give a snapshot of changes in an ecosystem. Essentially, declines in abundance are early warning indicators of overall environmental health, close quote. Fair enough, it certainly bodes ill for all of us, uh, of all of us that our waterways and forests can no longer support as many animals as they once could. But that is not what makes me so desperately sad. It's that so many trillions of animals are dead gone. The world is so much lonelier than it's ever been before, at least in the long eons since fish started crawling out on land. <clears throat> the wondrous, comical, cruel, buzzing, gouty, sexy carnival that is life has shut down most of its tents. The symphony of grunts, squeaks, roars, belches, and barks has faded to a diminuendo chorus. The creatures that always informed human dreams that ended up on masks and totem poles daubed on the walls of caves have wandered away into the mist. Over those five decades, meaning since 1970, over those five decades, most of the decline can be traced to habitat destruction. The human desire for ever more stuff playing out daily, acre by acre across the globe. I want a hamburger. A Brazilian entrepreneur wants money. Together, we hire, by the magic of the market, some poor soul who wants only to feed his family. Yes, and so he cuts down another swath of rainforest. And with it, a dozen species we have not even named yet. I want a house to live in, and the wood must come from somewhere. You might be able to hear the circular saw in the background sawing up the dead hemlock trees, uh, making the new tiny house. Yes, the wood must come from somewhere, and the coal and the oil to power it, and to power the car that takes me from there to the store. One of the ironies of the report 
is that wildlife has declined the least in North America and Europe, in part because it had already declined pretty steeply there prior to 1970, and in part because we have been rich enough to preserve some of our landscape, rich enough because we have had access to so many other landscapes. But in the decades ahead, the report makes clear that climate change will become the main driver of what they call in a technically precise but emotionally vacant phrase, biodiversity loss. As we raise the temperature and the pH of the oceans, we destroy those reefs that harbor so much of its beauty. As we raise the temperature of the air, we drive animals up the mountain until they hit the summit, and north until they run out of north. As Benjamin von Brockel writes in his moving new book titled Nowhere Left to Go, quote, the closer they get to the pole, the more the inhabitable territory shrinks. Earth is an ellipsoid after all, close quote. If you want good news, yes, if you want good news, it's that populations can in fact recover. Reproduction is a powerful force and given some space, animals can rebound. Now again, uh, Bill McKibben does not mention Chernobyl as the number one prime example of this, uh, but I will do it for Chernobyl uh, it is a perfect example. Get rid of the humans, watch all the rest of our fellow earthlings rebound to the way they were living before humans got there, even if it is a nuclear meltdown zone. Anyway, back to Bill. <clears throat> the authors of the new report note that when a couple of small and no longer useful dams were torn down on some New England streams, herring populations quickly rebounded from a few thousand to a few million, which doubtless did wonders for whoever eats herring too. There are paradoxes here. Building out clean energy is going to take some land that is useful for animals. See desert tortoises in the Mojave, but the scale of the destruction clearly in the offing, if we do not build out that energy, means we, sh we should give the benefit of the doubt to sun and wind. Now, of course, he is very careful not to say biomass burning. Uh, Bill McKibben is a major fan of biomass burning. But I guess the planet of the humans has finally gotten Bill McKibben to uh, keep his mouth shut about how we need to burn down the planet to save the planet. I said I wasn't going to get snarky. Anyway, so without mentioning biomass burning, Bill McKibben is on record, as so many others are, is to give the benefit of the doubt to all of these clean green energies uh, out there that compared to fossil fuels, uh, it's the lesser of two evils is what uh, Bill and, and so many others are banking on. Uh, you know, I have said from the very beginning, it is frying pan or the fire. It makes no difference 
whether it's fossil fuels powering 8 billion people on this planet or all of this other crap powering 8 billion people uh, on this planet. As long as there are 8 billion people on this planet, we are doomed. Okay? Frying pan or the fire, either one, until we bring the population of this planet down to closer to maybe 1 billion. Then we can talk about sun and wind and organic gardening. All right? But until then, it, 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 this whole debate is crap. It, it, it's greenwashing or brownwashing bullshit, depending on which side of the fence you're on. It makes no difference. It is absolutely a pointless debate. Uh, just getting people to fight with each other over a pointless debate while nobody is talking, and you sure as shit, this includes Bill McKibben, nobody is talking about uh, the problem on this planet. There's too damn many people on it. You will not see the word overpopulation or even population anywhere in this uh, reaction to the uh, dying planet index. And I never found the word overpopulation. I did find a couple uh, of times the word population was mentioned halfway through the thing. Anyway, I think I've gotten... Uh, off onto my own sermon. But anyway, getting back to Bill. <clears throat> All right, where was I? We should give the benefit of the doubt to sun and wind, still learning to do it in ways that offer the fewest insults to the rest of creation is what we should aim for. Fill solar farms with native plants for bees and butterflies. Yes, build them with wildlife corridors. Use offshore turbines to build coral reefs. But above all, do not let the planet keep warming. So we're going to use offshore wind turbines to save the coral reefs. Uh, we have <laughs> Bill, uh, Bill has clearly de descended in his, uh, in his advancing age in into, uh, I, I guess, senility is really taking over this old man's brain. But before we lose him, let's wrap this up. The World Wildlife Report points out that we cannot achieve the world's sustainable development goals hmm, unless we prevent a climate-led biodiversity collapse. But of course, what the World Wildlife Fund Report does not point out is that we cannot achieve the world's sustainable development goals even if we do prevent a climate-led biodiversity collapse, which we're not going to do anyway, but even if we could, uh, we could not achieve the world's sustainable development goals because there is no such thing as sustainable development. It is the oxymoron of the 21st century. There is nothing remotely sustainable about humans developing a planet. It is development by humans that took the planet to where we are. And I guess you know, maybe Bill McKibben uh, in another article, or you can find it in uh, Planet of the Humans, can sit there with a straight face, I guess, and claim that burning biomass, otherwise known as burning down the planet to save the planet, will uh, help us uh, reach 
the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yep. Okay. That, meaning, which is true, we can't achieve the World Sustainable Development Goals, and that is crucial, meaning preventing a climate-led biodiversity collapse. And we also cannot have a whimsical, magical, various world. Today, as I write this, the fall colors in Vermont. We were, I drove a couple of miles from Bill McKibben's house last week. I was thinking of looking him up and knocking on his door. I should have done that. Uh, today, as I write this, the fall color in Vermont has reached its apex for the year. The forest is fantastically decorated. I can hear, as I walk the dog, in the evening, the hoot ho, 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 of the barred owl. A deer just sauntered by. It's just too much. And compared with all prior history, not nearly enough. Thank you, Bill Kibben. Uh, I haven't checked out uh, Bill's newest book, Falter. Has the human game begun to play itself out? I think it's safe to say that the human game has begun to play itself out. There you go. So what is a description, as long as I'm on here? All right, should I buy this book? All right, 30 years ago, Bill McKibben offered one of the earliest warnings about climate change. Now he broadens the warning. The entire human game, he suggests, has begun to play itself out. <clears throat> Bill McKibben, Kibben's brown, groundbreaking book, The End of Nature, which I have done sermons from, uh, was the first book to alert us to global warming. I'm not at all sure that's true, but anyway. But the danger is broader than that. Even as climate change shrinks the space where our civilization can exist, New technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics threaten to bleach away the variety of human experience. Falter tells the story of these converging trends and of the ideological fervor that keeps us from, bring, from bringing them under control and then drawing on McKibben's experience in building 350.org, that hilariously named 350.org. Where are we? At about 422. The first truly global citizens movement to combat climate change, it offers some possible ways out of the trap. We are at a bleak moment in human history, and we will either confront that bleakness or watch the civilization our forebears built slip away. Falter is a powerful and sobering call to arms to save not only our planet, but also humanity. There you go. Maybe uh, maybe if I decide to stick it out here this winter, I can finally read Falter. Anyway, uh, now that I'm finished today's Doomsday Sermon, I'm going to take uh, Bill McKibben's advice, I think, and uh, I'm going to go 
clear a little biomass off of bugs in a jar farm. Uh, there is too much biomass and now that the leaves are falling off the trees I can finally get serious with my chainsaw uh, taking care of some of that pesky biomass I highly suggest you get out there and take care of some of that pesky biomass while well, you still can and you need to take care of that pesky chippy like that my guys Man, what a gorgeous day. The leaves are about done. I don't know why this willow tree is still dark green. Look at that gorgeous willow tree. Are you getting that chippy or not? Oh my gosh.